Good morning, and welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday of Easter. It's nice to have everybody gathered here, either in person or online. So I reach out to all of you who are worshiping online still and and offer our welcome to you as well. We have uh, this Friday, uh, first Friday with friends, uh, May the 7th at 7 o'clock. We're going to do that uh, in the garden, uh, in person. So I invite you to come on out and bring your beverages and some food to share, and we'll just enjoy that time together. Uh, We're down to the last week for uh, purchasing items for the Mother's Day purses, so if you want to get involved in that, uh, do that as well. We've got a date now for helping out at Grace Lutheran Church for their breakfast. They they have resumed their breakfasts there on Sunday morning, and uh, we've done this in the past. We need about a dozen people, and we've picked the Sunday of July the 4th. I know it's a holiday weekend, uh, so it's going to be troublesome for some of you, but if you think you could go, make sure you reach out to uh, Cindy Berkland or to me or to the office and let us know that you think you could be available that morning to go up there early uh, at uh, Grace Lutheran Church on July the 4th. Um, some of us need to have food handling licenses and so we can give you some instructions on that. It's really easy, it doesn't cost much and we can make that happen for you. So keep those kinds of things in mind. It's great that we're still able to be involved in those sorts of things and uh, can be concerned about our mission in the community. Today in our worship, in addition to our uh, regular church musicians, Jill and Lincoln, uh, we are delighted to have Katrina Becker and Renee Recklin on uh, violin and cello uh, to enhance our worship this morning. With that, let's take this time during the prelude and prepare ourselves for worship with a time of prayer and reflection. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gives us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Let us come into the light, the revealing and healing light of God. God of grace and glory, you have brought us through the night of sin into the light of Jesus' resurrection. Yet our lives are still shadowed by sin. Make us alive in Christ, O God. Make us new as we make all things new. Rescue us from evil and the gloom of sin. Renew us in grace and restore us to living in your holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Rejoice with all creation around God's throne. The light of the risen Christ puts to flight all evil deeds, washes away sin, restores innocence to the fallen, casts out hate, 
brings peace and humbles earthly pride. Jesus Christ loves you and frees you from your sins by his blood. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
O God, you give us your Son as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from 1 John, the fourth chapter. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loves us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he is in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May our hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch that withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Joy and I have this little uh, dwarf orange tree which grows in a big pot in our backyard. And uh, over the years, you know, it maybe has borne four or five oranges in a year. A couple of years ago, it bloomed profusely and there were 30, 40 oranges on this tree. And that's happened now for the last couple of years. But the first time as I, as I watched them grow, I could not see any way that that tiny little tree's branches could bear that much fruit. That's what our gospel lesson is about today, fruit, much fruit. Today we need to think of mental images of much fruit. Think of images of trees laden with apples or pears or oranges, all laden with enormous quantities of fruit. Imagine those trees in your mind and try to keep that image with you as we go through this today. Think of all that opulence of nature, clusters of grapes on grapevines, clusters of blueberries and blueberry bushes, clusters of cherries on cherry trees. Think much, much fruit. The New Testament talks about we humans as bearing fruit all the time. Now, Jesus, in this particular case today, does not get specific about what he meant by that. But by reading the Gospel of John and reading the later letters which John wrote, we know that what John meant here was love. The fruit that we should bear to the world is love. More specifically, if we know Jesus, then the fruit that we will bear will be kind of like a Jesus-likeness in the world. We will have the attitudes of Christ. We'll have the actions of Christ. We will practice Jesus' way of being a human being. The Apostle Paul tries to get at this idea when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He says, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That's nine of them. And I don't think it was meant to be an exhaustive list. Now, Paul sets all of those good gifts, all of those fruits of the Spirit against the baser qualities of human beings on their own. I don't think either Paul or John or Jesus see fruit as a list of virtues for which we are supposed to strive. It's a much more organic thing than that. Bearing fruit isn't something that you choose to do or choose not to do. It's an extension of what you are. You must bear fruit because of what you are, a disciple of Christ. God's desire for you is that you will produce good fruit because that is what you were created to do. God's yearning for you is that your life will reflect the love of Jesus to everyone who sees you, that your life will bear witness to the power of God's grace in the world. Now, Jesus says that there are two things necessary in order that we might bear good fruit in abundance. First, 
you must be connected to Jesus, connected to the Christ, the Messiah. Now, when Jesus said this, he was probably sitting at table on the last night having a meal together with his disciples. And I can almost imagine him getting up, walking around the table, pouring wine for his disciples as he talks about fruit and wine and vines and branches. Now, everybody in the room was familiar with grapevines, but even us city folks get the idea. When you cut a branch off of a vine or a tree, it dies. It doesn't take long, just a few hours, the green leaves will wilt and begin to curl up. They'll lose their rich green color. In just a few days, the leaves die because they are not connected to their source of life. And just as a grapevine dies when it's not connected to the branch, so also the spirit of love in us dies when we are not connected to God's Holy Spirit. And we will resort or revert to our basic, baser human instincts. C.S. Lewis wrote, God has designed the human machine to run on God's self. God himself is the fuel that our spirits were designed to burn or the food that our spirits were designed to eat. There is no other. And that is why it is just no good asking God to make us happy without bothering about religion. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from God's own self because it's not there. There is no such thing. Can we will ourselves to be good, to be healthy, to be happy, to be fruitful? On our own, disconnected, or connected to something to which we really do not belong, we spend our lives desperately searching for things which will fill our needs. The church itself can become part of the problem. If the church begins to exist for its members, instead of the members existing to serve the world. We have come to think so much like consumers that we find ourselves nearly always thinking of ourselves, meeting our own needs, putting ourselves first. Jesus suggests that we spend more time working out our connection to him. Hymn writers have the idea, but do we really believe what we sing? We sing about what a friend we have in Jesus, but we live as if we're friendless. We sing about leaning on the everlasting arms, but we go around as if we're falling apart. We sing about being one in mission, but we each live for our own agendas. Living fruitful lives happens when we are connected, part of Jesus' body and Jesus' people. Good fruit happens because he abides in us and we in him. And that brings us to the second point Jesus makes today, in order for you to produce the most abundant fruit, you need to realize that God's going to have to do a little pruning on you from time to time. I mean, left to their own, grapevines spend much energy sending out runners, making new vines, baking big, beautiful leaves, and spreading across the forest floor, seeking new places to grow. Fruit trees will add branches to themselves until they are so dense that they virtually choke themselves to death. That kind of riotous, undisciplined growth leaves too little energy to produce the most abundant crop of fruit. For a wild grapevine growing in the woods, covering the ground with vines and leaves may be fine, but for a vineyard, the goal is not producing leaves and vines. The goal is the production of grapes. In order to produce the most abundant crop of grapes or apples or berries or whatever, the, whatever, the plant's energy must be redirected. It must be disciplined from a production of vines and branches and leaves to the production of fruit. Our lives also must be redirected and disciplined if we are able to be productive for God's sake in the world. 
Left to our own, we will work for 100 hours a week to own a bigger house, drive a nicer car, amass a larger retirement fund. Because all those things are important to us and to our families. And because we know that no one else is going to worry about our retirement if we don't. Because we know if it is to be, it's up to me. But there is something more to life. God calls us into a fruitful life, a life poured out in love toward others. God invites us to allow him to prune our lives, to cut away the things that distract us from living as a reflection of Jesus, to clear away all that is in us which is dying and decaying, to prune out that which takes energy away from loving our neighbors. Each person has unique abilities. We are all, to push the metaphor a little bit, different varieties of grapes. In the real world of winemaking, there's Cabernet Sauvignon grapes and Cabernet Franc grapes and there's Pinot Noir grapes and there's Chardonnay and Riesling and all the others. So it is in the kingdom of God. Some who grow on one vine of Christ are preachers and teachers. And others are skilled hosts or musicians. Others can feed the needy and others can advocate for social justice. Different talents, different gifts, but the same fruit, love. If we abide in the vine of Christ Jesus, then we cannot produce sour grapes. We cannot produce a berry which will cause division and discord, hurt feelings, and fractured relationships. That kind of fruit cannot grow from the vine trunk of Jesus. When we are connected, our lives will reflect the love of Jesus to everyone who sees us. Our lives will bear witness to the transforming power of God's grace. And with a little pruning here and there, collectively, we, the people of God, will produce fruit and produce it with such abundance that the world around us will be changed because of it. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. God of all fruitfulness, you abide in your church and your church abides in you. Cleanse us by your word and give yourself to the whole church on earth so that it bears fruit and witness to your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have created the heavens and the earth. As we wonder at the beauty of creation, may we seek vital connections among all that depends on the earth for life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule the nations with justice and love. Give the leaders of the earth assurance of your abiding presence, that they lead not by fear, but with love for those they are called to serve. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have loved us so that we can love others. We pray for all in need of your love, those who are poor, lowly, outcast, weak, or fearful. Provide for the needs of all, especially Rod, Kate, Eric, Catherine, Charles, Ken, Jim, Catherine, Stu, Mich Michelle, and Lana, Ryan, P. 
Katie, George, Darren, Tom, Tony, Patsy, Stacy, Terry, Robert, Marissa, Larry, Jean, June, Kristen, Scott, Susan, the family of George Doss, Donna, Glenn E, Michael and Therese, Jory and Lester, Mike, Lois, Diana, Steve, Paul, George, Sheila, Larry, Amanda, Jim, Rick, Kathy, Joe, Ellen, Randy, Paul, Umberto, Tom, Corinne, Debbie, Ellen, John, Monica, Joel, Jeff, Ollie, Stephanie, Brett, Judy, Scott, Kristen, Ron, Joel, Jean, Donna, and Jean. And for all whom we pray now, aloud or in our hearts. Our heart. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You gather us with all the saints by the power of your spirit. With them, may our hearts live forever in your keeping. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and give us the offer. Abide with us and send us in service to the celebrate world. For the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be he with you. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. And now let us pray together in the words which our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is ready. Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace this day and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, 
Through his meal, you have put gladness in our hearts, satisfied the hunger still around us, and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all the people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus. The God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.